Hello, and welcome to part three of Satellite Data for Air Quality, Environmental Justice, and Equity Applications. Part three will focus on interactive exercises for using satellite and demographic data. My name is Sarah Strode. I'm an Associate Research Scientist for Morgan State University, and I do atmospheric chemistry research at NASA Goddard through the Guest Star 2 program. In today's training, we will hear from Dr. Gage Kerr, a Senior Research Scientist at George Washington University, and Dr. Carl Mallings, who gave part two of this training. Today's session has two main objectives. The first objective is to be able to import relevant air quality data sets into the EJ Screen tool and use EJ Screen to investigate and compare air quality with other environmental and demographic data sets. The second objective is to pair appropriate satellite data sets for environmental indicators with demographic information using Python. Before we begin, let's review some of what we learned in session two. Last week, we learned about some of the many NASA and European Space Agency missions, satellites, and instruments, which collect data relevant for air quality. These include polar orbiting instruments like MODIS, VIRS, OMI, and TROPOMI, geostationary missions like GOES and the recently launched TEMPO, and upcoming missions like MAYA, which will be NASA's first explicitly health-focused mission. The different properties of satellites and their instruments affect what kinds of data they collect. For example, polar orbiting satellites can collect data around the world, but only have about one opportunity per day to observe a given location. In contrast, geostationary orbiting satellites can observe at multiple times of the day, but they view a single hemisphere or part of a hemisphere. Spectral resolution is also important. Multispectral instruments provide data relevant to aerosols, while hyperspectral instruments have the spectral resolution necessary to provide data about atmospheric trace gases. In many cases, satellites are providing information about column quantities, such as aerosol optical depth or the NO2 column. It's important to remember that although these quantities can be indicative of ground level pollution, they are not the same thing. In order to get ground level air quality estimates from column data, it's necessary to combine the satellite data with other information, such as from models or from ground-based measurements where available to create what we call level four data products. These products are combinations of data from multiple different sources. Finally, part two covered some of NASA's free online tools for visualizing, accessing, and analyzing satellite data. These tools include NASA WorldView, Earth Data Search, and Giovanni. Here's a quick reminder of how to ask questions that may come up during today's training. Please put your questions in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. We will try to get to as many of the questions as possible during the Q&A session. And any questions we don't get to will be answered in the Q&A document. The Q&A document will be posted to the training website about a week after the training. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Gage Kerr to present the interactive exercises. Thank you, Sarah. My name is Gage Kerr. I currently work at George Washington University as a senior research scientist. And today I'm going to be talking about how we can use satellite and demographic data in interactive ways to better understand air quality and EJ. We're going to launch today by talking about EJ Screen, which is the EPA or Environmental Protection Agency's environmental justice screening and mapping tool. This tool, as I mentioned, was developed by the EPA, and it provides a nationally consistent way to combine environmental, demographic, and socioeconomic data. The tool is a graphical user interface, which is just a fancy way of saying that you as the user can interact with it by dragging, clicking, highlighting, and selecting, rather than having to write your own original computer code and download data. For these reasons, EJ Screen is very accessible to those who have an internet connection. EJ Screen supports many different actions and goals across the Environmental Protection Agency. To give you a little taste of what some of these actions include, EJ Screen supports informing outreach and engagement practices. EJ Screen supports being an initial screen for voluntary programs, enhanced outreach and permitting, and prioritizing enforcement work. EJ Screen also supports the development of retrospective reports of EPA work. And finally, 
EJ screen helps to enhance place-based activities. The unit of analysis for EJ screen is the census block group. You might remember hearing about census block groups and census tracts earlier in this training. Block groups are the next smallest unit of analysis considered by the US Census Bureau. Census block groups, as you can see from the image on the screen, are subdivisions of census tracts and generally have between about 250 and 550 housing units. Within urban areas, you can think of these block groups as small neighborhoods that aim to have between 600 and 3,000 residents. But in rural areas, in order to meet this population quota, sometimes block groups can be much larger in area. Again, the illustration that you see on this slide shows the hierarchy of different administrative units considered by the US Census Bureau. Currently, EJ screen includes 13 environmental indicators, such as fine particulate matter concentrations, ozone concentrations, Superfund proximity, proximity to wastewater discharge, and many more shown on this slide. There are also seven socioeconomic indicators that I haven't shown today on the slide for the sake of time, but they include fields like percent people of color, percent low income, unemployment rate, and others. Now these environmental indicators and socioeconomic indicators are combined to form what are known as EJ indices. There are currently 13 EJ indices and 13 more supplemental indices, again, that combine information on environmental hazards with socioeconomic indicators. Now, specifically, these indices are calculated by multiplying two different terms together, the environmental indicator and the demographic index. And you can see the formulas here for how these different parts of this equation and how these different parts of the indices are derived. Now these indices are higher in block groups that have a larger number of mainly low income and or people of color and a higher environmental indicator value. The unit of these analyses or the units of these indices rather are percentiles, which gives information about the percentage of census block groups in an underlying state or country that have a value for a given EJ index that is less than the value for a particular block group of interest. EJ Screen's data inputs represent a mixture of observed versus modeled or estimated products. For example, the lead paint indicator is based on data related to housing stock age, while other indicators like the fine particulate matter and ozone concentrations derive from a complex computer model that simulates these pollutants and the meteorology, emissions, and chemistry that drive them. The time period that these different data inputs represent also vary across indicators, as you can see from the table in this slide. Some of the inputs are updated less frequently than others, but the EPA does try to update EJ screen inputs as new data become available. The graphical user interface of EJ screen provides a number of capabilities, including color coded mapping, the ability to generate an EJ related report for a selected area, as well as comparison showing how a selected area of interest and its environmental exposures and demographics compare to the state or to the US as a whole. Now, no tool is perfect, and I wanna spend a little time describing some limitations and omissions related to EJ screen and how they relate to this training's focus on satellite data. First, EJ screen indices represent screening level proxies for risk and exposure and not actual risk and exposure. As I mentioned earlier, the unit of EJ screens indices is percentiles. And while these percentiles provide a useful perspective and put the indices in common units, they just tell us whether scores are equally common or equally rare. And they don't really mean that two different risks that might have the same percentile score are actually comparable. EJ screen is also only available for the US, so folks eager to understand environmental or climate justice outside the US won't have this easy to use screening tool at their fingertips. As I alluded to in the previous slide, data inputs in EJ screen might be out of date. Moreover, the spatial resolution of some of the data inputs is coarse and doesn't necessarily support having information at the census block group level. This is something I'm very passionate about because I feel that in order to really understand and act on some of the environmental justices that we know that exist, 
we need the highest resolution and state of the science data at our fingertips. To illustrate this point a little bit further, I want us to think about the fine particulate matter and ozone concentrations that are included in EJ screen. These different data sets come to us from a computer model that has a 12 by 12 kilometer or about 7.5 by 7.5 mile resolution across the US. If you're not familiar with model resolutions and, and some of this terminology, I want us to think of a fishnet. Imagine spreading a fishnet over the entire US. Now each of the little cells or boxes that comprise that fishnet, you can think of those as the model grid cells. And as I mentioned, each of those small boxes are about 12 kilometers on each side. Yet I mentioned before that census block groups are small administrative units that have about 600 to 3,000 residents. And in urban areas, they're generally much smaller than a 12 by 12 kilometer box. Therefore, these particulate matter and ozone inputs in EJ screen might not be able to fully discern or resolve differences in pollutant concentrations from census block group to census block group. You can see an example of this in the map on the right, which shows Baltimore City in Maryland. It doesn't really matter specifically what the colors in this map represent, but I want us to focus on those individual little polygons. Each of those polygons is a census block group. Now use that scale bar at the bottom and try to assess how large of a city Baltimore is. We take that scale bar and compare it with the width of the city, what we find is that Baltimore is about 12 miles stretching from west to east. But remember I said that the model resolution of the PM 2.5 and ozone data in the EJ screen has a resolution of about 7.5 by 7.5 miles. So what that means is that this whole domain of Baltimore City, which is comprised of hundreds of census block groups, is likely only represented by a couple unique values in the underlying particulate matter and ozone data sets at EJ screen. Finally, to speak to one last limitation of EJ screen, there are several environmental impacts and demographic indicators that might be relevant to a particular location or even to the US as a whole that aren't included in the satellite and the screening tool. And also no satellite data is directly used in the screening tool, despite the fact that in this training, we've talked about the troves and troves of satellite data from NASA and other space agencies. Recognizing that satellite data have increasingly high spatial resolution, they also have the ability to provide near real time information on environmental impacts, as well as represent semi empirical observations, rather than some of the model indicators included in EJ screen. Our NASA HACAST Tiger team developed a test data set based on satellite data that can be incorporated into EJ screen. And we'll explore that next. In this training's first session, we heard from Dr. Susan Annenberg at George Washington University how PM 2.5 concentrations where you live can be visualized in EJ screen. We're now going to upload this custom data set that I just mentioned to EJ screen to understand nitrogen dioxide or NO2 pollution. You've heard of NO2 in other parts of this training, but I just want to reiterate that exposure to nitrogen dioxide or NO2 is associated with a number of health impacts, including asthma onset and exacerbation, cardiovascular issues, and even premature death. Nitrogen dioxide can also participate in chemical reactions in the atmosphere that can go on to create other health harming pollutants like ozone. NO2 generally is a proxy for traffic related pollution and the scientific literature shows us that this pollution source disproportionately impacts marginalized and minoritized communities in the US. But yet it's not included in EJ screen as one of those 13 default indicators that I showed a few slides ago. Therefore, it's really great that we as EJ screen users can have the ability to explore the environmental justice implications of other data sets within EJ screen by uploading them as a custom data layer. And I just want to speak to this NO2 data set a little bit more and explain why it's relevant to this particular R set trading. This data set was formed by combining satellite derived NO2 from NASA's ozone monitoring instrument with a land use regression model. These two different data inputs allow us to estimate surface level NO2 concentrations globally during the 21st century. And what we did is we specifically took this data set at its native resolution, which is at a resolution of a kilometer by a kilometer, 
and we averaged it to underlying census block groups in the United States. So we averaged it to the unit of analysis that EJ Screen uses. We then took these census block groups averages and with help from Colleen Heck at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, generated an online data set that can be directly integrated into EJ Screen. This particular data set represents NO2 concentrations in units of parts per billion averaged over the year 2019. The image that you see on the screen, courtesy of Emily Reichert at George Washington University, shows what the census block group averaged NO2 data set looks like in the US, as well as in many urban areas that we've zoomed into. Now it's time for all of us to upload this data set as a custom layer in EJ Screen. And to do this, you'll both need to open up the EPA's EJ Screen website, as well as get the link that was provided in our training materials that links to this NO2 data set. Hopefully what you see on your screen looks similar to mine, although maybe you're zoomed into a different part of the US. So what we're gonna to do to start is we're gonna click on the tools button. This tools button is given by this pen and wrench icon towards the top left of the screen. Once you click on that, you should see some options appear. And I want us next to click on the add map services button. This sh should pop up a small window on your screen, and I want us to then go to the URL field that's highlighted with this red asterisk. Let's delete the HTTPS, and once that's deleted, I'd like you to paste in the link that was provided in our training materials. Again, this link takes us to an online database containing block group NO2 averages in the US. Once you've pasted that link there, we can click Add to Map, and if we wait a few seconds, depending on your internet connection, you should be able to see NO2 concentrations appear on the map. If your connection is maybe a little bit slow like mine, we'll maybe take a few seconds now and I'll just explain a little bit more of what is represented by this map. For your awareness, this URL links to an ArcGIS REST API, which is essentially a way that we can access maps, features, and imagery using ArcGIS online. Again, this map represents tens of thousands of block group averages of NO2 in the US, so it might take a little while to load. Uh, but hopefully, me talking for a few seconds now has given your connection and this map enough time to load. So once it's loaded, you should notice that a box appears in the top right window, and this box details the legend for this map. So it shows us what the different colors represent regarding the different NO2 concentrations. So there you have it. Again, what you're seeing are NO2 concentrations that NASA satellite data have enabled us to estimate. Because this is a custom data layer in EJ screen, we're only going to be able to see NO2 concentrations rather than an EJ index that was formed using both NO2 concentrations and demographics. If you recall from one of my earlier slides, for environmental indicators that are included by default in the screening tool, such as PM215 and ozone, EJ Screen computes those EJ indices, which again, relate environmental information for a given block group with demographic information for that block group. So even though we don't have those EJ indices in the case of NO2, there is a crude workaround in EJ Screen that I personally like to use when visualizing this custom data set. And this crude workaround will allow us to visualize the NO2 data set alongside information about demographics. And this crude workaround is what's known as EJ screen side-by-side -side map comparisons. So to access these side-by-side -side maps, I want us to click on the side-by-side -side comparisons in the map on the left. You might need to click out of this add map services um, window. But then there, once you've clicked out of that, you should see these side-by-side -side comparisons under the tool tab. So if we click on that, a new window or a new tab should open. And unfortunately, we're going to have to repeat the process we just did and re-upload the NO2 data. So to do that, you can go to this map data dropdown on the map on the left. And the way that this map data dropdown is configured is a little bit different than what we saw in the previous slide, but you'll notice at the top there is an add map service radio button. And if you click on that radio button, you should see a pretty familiar screen pop up that has a place for you to copy it and paste a URL. 
So I want us to repeat what we just did. We can erase this HTTP from the URL field and then repaste our link to the ArcGIS NO2 data set. And then we'll click Update Map. Again, it might take a little while, but those NO2 concentrations should appear on our screen. Now on the map on the right, we can add demographic data. And again, look at these two different variables, NO2 and demographic side by side. So to add data to this map on the right, we can click on the map data drop-down menu on the top. And by default, the demographic radio button should be highlighted. And then we can start playing around with the different categories and the variables. You'll notice that there are several different broad categories ranging from education to health to population. And then each one of these categories has a whole slate of variables associated with it. You can peruse what these different categories and variables mean on your own time, but what I want to focus on now is the population category. This category contains a lot of the familiar race, ethnicity, and age information that we might think of when we think of census data. So once we've selected the population category, we can go to the variable drop-down menu, and I want us to scroll down to the percent or PCT people of color population. If we click on that and then hit update map, it might take a second or two, uh, but we should now see a different variable appear. And again, this variable summarizes the percent people of color in each census block group. And just one last thing before we start exploring these different data sets, if you want to know what the different colors represent, you can hit the legend button on the top right of each map, and then you'll see a color-coded legend showing what's shown for the different maps. As you zoom in and out of this map and pan from north to south and east to west, you'll notice that the two different maps mirror each other. So it allows us to, again, see NO2 and demographics in uh, the consistent regions or cities. So I want to spend a few minutes now and scroll over to Baltimore City. Baltimore happens to be where I'm sitting as I make this recording. And I want us to explore how we can use these side-by-side -side map comparisons to think about this traffic-related pollutants and demographics in Baltimore City. So I'll zoom into Baltimore and I encourage you to do the same. For those who might not be familiar with Baltimore, it's on the US's east coast. It's a little bit north of Washington, D.C. And if you're able to zoom in, you might see this boundary that looks kind of like a square with a triangle attached to the bottom. That is Baltimore City. Let's start by looking at this map on the right, which again shows the percent people of color. What you might notice right off the bat is that there's a lot of racial segregation in Baltimore. You'll notice two lobes of the city called East and West Baltimore, where there is a very high proportion of people of color. If you read literature on the history, urban planning, redlining, or other related topics in the city of Baltimore, you might see these parts of the cities referred to by sociologists and urban planners as the quote unquote black butterfly. The part of the city that I'm tracing now with my mouse that runs more or less due north south and then extends eastward along Baltimore City's harbor tends to have a larger proportion of white residents, as you can see from the lighter colors. And this part of the city in the literature is often referred to as the white L. Now the NO2 map on the left displays a slightly different pattern of variability than that racial map on the right that we just summarized. One thing to notice that if we look at the legend is that for most of the domain that we're zoomed into here, NO2 concentrations are either this darkish orange color or various shade of, shades of red, maroon, or even black. So this means that almost all NO2 concentrations in Baltimore are estimated to be above six parts per billion. The reason that I'm highlighting this right now is because back in 2021, the World Health Organization released new air quality guidelines based on the latest epidemiological evidence. And these guidelines recommended that annual average NO2 concentrations, which is what's shown here for 2019, should not exceed approximately five parts per billion. What we see in this map is that much of the city of Baltimore exceeds these guidelines. And of course, this finding isn't unique to just Baltimore, but is fairly commonplace across global urban areas. The highest levels of NO2 are located in Baltimore city center, 
near what's referred to as the Inner Harbor. These high concentrations extend radially outward for about a mile or so. But you'll notice that there are some pockets or islands within this domain that have higher NO2 concentrations than might be expected given their surroundings. One example of this you can find in the NO2 map on the left where interstates 95 and 695 intersect. And I'm highlighting that area here with my mouse. So specifically, you'll notice here that concentrations are around 12 to 15 parts per billion and are higher than some of the immediately surrounding areas. And this finding of pockets or islands of areas with higher NO2 extends to other parts of the city and generally are co-located with places that have heavy industry or mobile sources of NO2. Now, although I mentioned that the map showing the percent people of color on the right displays different patterns of spatial variability than the NO2 concentrations on the left, there is some correspondence. One example of this is if you look at the neighborhoods of Curtis Bay, Cherry Hill, and Brooklyn. And I'm zooming into them right now. One thing to note on the map on the left, on the right, sorry, showing the percent people of color is that there's a census block group near these neighborhoods that's comprised entirely of industrial facilities, logistics centers, transportation terminals, and the like. So this block group has a population of zero, a permanent population of zero, so it's not colored in this map. However, if we look at the population and the percent people of color of some of the nearby census block groups, what we see is that they have a very large proportion or percentage of people of color living in them and, and represent environmental justice communities. If we shift back to the map on the left showing NO2 concentrations near this Cherry Hill, Curtis Bay, Brooklyn area, what we see is that NO2 concentrations are high, about 12 parts per billion or even greater. What's more is that there are other parts of Baltimore that are equally equidistant from the polluted city center that have much lower NO2 concentrations. So these Cherry Hill, Curtis Bay, and Brooklyn neighborhoods are quite unique in how overburdened they are with pollution. And this finding doesn't just extend to NO2 pollution, which is what we're showing here, but also extends to other air pollutants and air toxics. Now, why might this be that these neighborhoods are so overburdened with NO2 and other forms of pollution? Well, for those of you who might have some familiarity with Baltimore and local knowledge, what you might know is that there's an incinerator, a railroad facility, two nearby power generation facilities, and a smattering of highways and interstates that all surround these neighborhoods and contribute to this pollution problem. About 10 years ago, a report released by the Environmental Integrity Project said that despite improvements made to two nearby power generation facilities, Curtis Bay, was the top zip code in Maryland for air toxic pollution. This report mentioned also that over a third of all air toxic emissions in the entire state of Maryland were emitted in this one small area near Curtis Bay. As I showed in the map on the right, this area is home to a large proportion of people of color, and we can also explore whether other demographic groups uh, are co-located with this large proportion of people of color. So we can do that by revisiting this map data button, and we can take a look at some of the other categories and variables. So let's say we're interested in understanding whether these findings for communities of color and NO2 pollution extend to people living in poverty. So we can go to the income poverty tab, and then we might look at fields like the percent household income less than, let's say, $10,000. And if we update the map, we can see that some of these communities that are immediately adjacent to all of these pollution sources in Curtis Bay, Cherry Hill, and Brooklyn have a high proportion, at least compared to other parts of the cities, of households that have very low income. Now, this anecdotal example from Baltimore speaks to the utility and power of EJ Screen. With just an internet connection and this link that was provided to you through the training materials, we can zoom into a city or region of our choice and use our local knowledge and context to understand some of the co-location between air pollution and other environmental hazards, as well as demographic indicators. 
This specific example we just went through for Baltimore, again, was made possible by leveraging Earth observations of nitrogen dioxide pollution from satellite instruments. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, EJ screen currently doesn't include information on the traffic-related pollutant NO2, but we hope that future versions of EJ screen might rely more heavily on satellite-based measurements of this particular air pollutant, as well as satellite-based measurements of other air pollution as well. As we've discussed in the previous parts of this training, and as I mentioned earlier in today's training, space-based measurements are available in near real time and are oftentimes subject to fewer assumptions and errors than some of the modeling estimates that EJ screen currently uses. Now it's your turn to explore how NO2 and demographic indicators vary in an area that's of interest to you and that you might have local knowledge and expertise on. I want you first to pick out an area that, again, you might be interested in, and then I want you to think about the following questions. Which parts of your chosen city or area have high NO2? What industries or NOx sources might lead to these spatial patterns of high NO2 in certain areas of your city or region? Does NO2 vary with, with race, educational attainment, or income? What factors might be relevant in explaining the co-location of marginalized population groups with high NO2? Some factors that come to mind are things like redlining or historic parts of the city or area where industries tended to congregate. And then finally, are there no NOx sources that aren't apparent in the region that you're interested in? I'm gonna leave up these questions and pause now for a few minutes while you explore this tool. If you have any questions or experienced any problems, please feel free to put them in the chat and they'll be addressed by trainers as time allows.
hopefully your independent exploration of EJ screen, specifically using the custom NO2 data set alongside demographic information, allowed you to find some interesting results that might even inform some of the work that you all do. We're going to pivot now and talk about another tool that we can use to understand air inequality in the US. And it's a Python based approach. Now, EJ Screen is a fantastic resource for those who might not have a strong background doing formal data analyses through softwares like GIS, MATLAB, R, or Python. EJ Screen is also great for an introductory analysis where you want to explore whether there's a potential relationship between demographic and environmental variables, but you might not want to invest a lot of time acquiring your own data inputs and writing your own code to investigate a relationship that might or might not exist. However, EJ Screen doesn't provide everything. Let's say you're tasked with calculating a quantitative value. Maybe your employer wants you to calculate the concentration of NO2 in parts per billion for a particular city or a particular county. In theory, you could click on every census block group in EJ Screen, jot down the concentrations that appear when you click, and then average them. But as you probably saw from some of the maps you looked at, counties might contain thousands of census block groups. So obviously this is not a very sustainable way to go about things or an efficient use of your time. Or let's say you work for a city or county health department and you're charged with calculating differential exposure among different demographic groups. You'd be hard pressed to do this using EJ Screen or an other interactive screening tool alone. So in response to some of these limitations, the last part of today's session, and in fact, this entire training will focus on how we can do these things I just mentioned in Python. For those who might not be familiar, Python is an open source coding language. I'll show how we can manipulate and aggregate input data and make maps similar to the ones you saw on EJ screen, as well as calculate statistics. Right now, I'm gonna pass things over to Dr. Carl Mallings, who will help us set up our Google Colab environment and make sure that this environment is ready for us to do some Python coding, as well as make sure that the data inputs we need for this exercise are in the correct location. Thanks, Gage. I'm gonna walk through the instructions to set up this demo in Google Colab. Uh, these instructions are in a PDF document, which you can access through the RSET training webpage. They should also be in the handout section of the GoToWebinar meeting. So this is the PDF document up on the left side of the screen. Um, I'm going to actually skip this first step. This is just instructions on how to create a Google account, uh, access your Google Drive, and to enable Google Collaboratory, which is the plugin for Google Drive that we'll be using today to run our Python code demonstration examples. Um, if you haven't done this already, you can run through these instructions to set it up for yourself. Uh, I already have this enabled, so I'm just going to skip to the next page, which starts with specific instructions on how to set up materials for this exercise. So the first step is to create a folder called SD for EJ Python exercise in your Google Drive. I'm just going to copy that folder name there. And then I'm going to go to my Google Drive here. In the upper left hand corner, I have a button called new. I click on that, select new folder, uh, paste in the name for the folder, SD for EJ underscore Python underscore exercise and hit create. And that new folder should then show up in my Google Drive. Uh, the next step indicates that we should go to the RSET webpage for this training and scroll down to part three, which is the part uh, we're going through today, which has the relevant Python exercise materials. So I already have that web page open in another tab here. I'm just going to scroll down um, to the part three section, which is here, and scroll down a little bit further to the section on introduction to Python based analysis. Um, and in that section, there are two things uh, we have to do. The first is to download the uh, relevant exercise um, notebook, which is called the SD for EJ underscore Python underscore exercise dot IPYNB. That's a Python notebook file type. Um, and there's a link to that right here on the training web page. Um, if I click on that link, it will download the zip drive or zip file containing that file. 
um, I can just click on it and it will download for me. Uh, you may need to right click and select save as um, if it doesn't download automatically for you. But once it's downloaded, it should show up in my downloads folder. You can see it here um, before uh, using it. So this is a .zip file. I need to extract the content. So if I right click extract, um, however you typically use zip files to extract them, and you'll see the uh, IPYNB file, the Python notebook file has been extracted from that zip file. Um, so once that's downloaded, the next uh, step in the instructions is to upload that into your Google Drive into the folder we just created. So if I go back to my Google Drive, I go into the folder we just created, and then I take from my downloads and just drag and drop to upload the file into my Google Drive, and you'll see it's shown up there now. Uh, the next step, go back to the RSET web page and click on a link to open the shared exercise materials folder. So if I go back to the training web page, uh, right under the link I just clicked to download that file, there's another link here, Python exercise materials folder. If I click on that, it will open up a shared Google Drive with a folder inside called SD for EJ Python exercise materials. Uh, basically, this folder contains all the materials, the data we'll be using in our exercise today. Uh, and rather than having you download that data directly, what we've uh, decided to do for this training is show you how to set up a remote link or a shortcut to this shared folder in your own Google Drive. So to do that, uh, we follow the next few steps in the instructions, which are to click on the folder, uh, click once, and then right click. Under the Organize menu, there's an option to add shortcut. If I click on that button, it will show up uh, a link of a list of places where I can add my shortcut. Here on the Suggested menu, I already have my SD for EJ Python exercise folder um, already shows up on the Suggested menu. Uh, it may not do that for you since it's a new folder you just created. Um, you can always go to the All Locations button here, uh, double click on your drive to open, and then browse through until you find that folder. Since it's showing up for me there, I just click on that folder where I want to add it, and I press the Add button. And now if I go back to my own Google Drive, inside that folder we just created earlier, in addition to the IPYNB file we uploaded, there's now a second object here, which is has this little icon here. This is a shortcut to the shared SD for EJ Python exercise materials folder. So once we've done that, um, the next step is to open up the exercise in Google Colab. So for me, since I've already enabled Google Colab, if I just double click on this folder, it will automatically open in a new Google Colab tab. Um, if it didn't do that automatically for you, you might right click on it under open with. Uh, for me, again, there's an option for Google Colaboratory. I'd click on that. Otherwise, you click on the connect more apps button here and it'll bring up this menu if you type in the search uh, collaboratory right there. It should come up here. For me, you know, it says it's already installed because I've installed it already. If not, you might have to click on this and go through the instructions to install collaboratory. Uh, but meanwhile, so I've opened up the exercise in Google Colab. Uh, just a little bit about Google Colab. This is a, an environment for running different types of code um, remotely without using your own computer's resources to run them. In this case, specifically, as I mentioned, we're running an IPYNB file, which is a Python notebook, or sometimes called a Jupyter notebook, uh, J-U-Y, uh, sorry, J-U-P-Y-T-E-R is how it's spelled, but uh, Jupyter notebook. This is basically an interactive version of uh, Python code. And the notebook contains uh, different types of sections. The first is a text type section, which you can see up here. This is basically just the instructions I just had you walk through to set up the exercise material. And the other type is a code type section. You can see the code, uh, the Python code written here. Um, in addition, you might notice if you scroll through the rest of these files that underneath the code sections, the output from the code is also embedded in the file. Um, just for ease of, of, of use with this type of file, you can save a version of the file that has the code uh, outputs already embedded in the file. And we've actually shared a version like that with you just so you have access to the uh, fully run and complete version of the code, just in case during at any point in the exercise today, you're not able to run a section, 
uh, you'll still have access to what the output should have been if you were able to run it correctly, but hopefully that won't be an issue. But again, just in case you want to include those outputs along with the code itself. Um, if you want to start from a fresh version, um, underneath the edit menu at the top here, there's an option to clear all outputs. So if you click that, it would clear all the outputs from the code and you'd start from a, a fresh blank version. Um, again, we're not going to do that today, just uh, just to run through and, and have you I'll let you have access to the outputs just in case there's a problem on your end at any point, but hopefully that won't be an issue. So anyway, returning to the um, notebook, uh, before running any of the code, we have to connect to an environment. And we do that in the upper right corner with this connect button here. So if I click on that button, you'll see uh, some messages popping up uh, and eventually it'll give you a, a little green check mark. And what it's done is basically allocated you some disk space and some computing resources, some, some processors on a Google server somewhere. So you're not actually using your own computer's resource to, resources to run this code. The code's being run offsite uh, at a Google server somewhere and you're just seeing the outputs of that code. Uh, and this is very useful, so you don't have to go through any of the setup on your own computer to set up Python and install any of the required packages. Uh, everyone who's running this code will be running from the same environment, uh, running remotely, so it's it's not gonna be affected as much by the peculiarities of your own system. And this, we just find this is a better way to uh, share code and have it used by multiple people very easily without uh, a lot of setup, other than accessing the data that you need, which is what we just ran through. So the first step here, um, again, we've we've run through all these instructions. So the first block of code here is doing a couple things. Uh, so to run this block of code, if I hover over it, you'll see in the upper left corner of the block, a little arrow uh, play button. And if I click on that, it'll start running this block. And what this block of code does is, first, it requests permission to access your Google Drive. And I'm gonna go through the steps, uh, say connect, connect to Google Drive, select my account, and then uh, press the allow to grant it permission. Um, and this will then grant Google Colab access to the data in your Google Drive. In addition to just uh, granting access, it also performs two checks. Uh, first, it checks that in your Google Drive, there is this folder called SD for EJ Python exercise, which I had you create earlier. And then secondly, it checks that within that folder, there's a subfolder, or in this case, a shortcut, to this folder, the exercise materials folder. Um, and you can see in my in my uh, Python, you can see the outputs, it says the exercise file directory was located, and then the shortcut to the uh, training materials was also located, so, and it says we're ready to proceed. Uh, again, if it, if it didn't find either of those two folders it was looking for, it would give an error message, and you'd go back and check that those were available. But since it says we're ready pr to proceed, I'm gonna scroll down to the next section, and hand it back to Gage, who will take us through the rest of the exercise. Thanks for assisting us with the setup, Carl. If you haven't already, please navigate to the part of the code that says install the GeoPandas package. And you can hit the play button between the brackets to make sure that this runs. I'll explain what GeoPandas is in a second, but hopefully you're able to see this little green check mark appear next to this snippet of code. Let's scroll down now to the part of the code that says import the required packages. That GeoPandas term that you just saw in the previous line of code now appears here next to an import statement. So let's run these statements and I'll explain a little bit about what's going on when we run them. There are three different li libraries here, GeoPandas, NumPy, and Matplotlib. These libraries are gonna be essential to help us with our Python exercise today. GeoPandas allows us to read and plot a geodatabase. You can think of a geodatabase kind of like a typical CSV or Excel file, but a geodatabase also contains information about geometry. In our case, each row of the geodatabase represents a different census block group, and the different columns represent relevant variables like NO2 concentrations and demographic data. And then finally, to speak to what I just mentioned about geometry, one column of this geodatabase that we're going to use GeoPandas to analyze represents the geometries or the borders of census block groups. Moving on to NumPy. For those who might be familiar with Python, I'm sure you've heard of NumPy. 
NumPy is one of the most commonly used Python libraries, and it allows us to perform mathematical operations on our data. Finally, matplotlib is another very commonly used Python library that is going to assist us in creating data visualizations and plots. Now let's go to the next snippet of code and we can hit the run or play button. It might take a minute or two depending on your connection. What's happening here is that GeoPandas, that library that allows us to read geodatabases, is reading our input file. This file is one that I put together and it represents NO2 concentrations and demographics in the state of Maryland. So the NO2 data used in this geodatabase that we're loading in here is the same data that we just used in our custom EJ screen layer. And you can recall that this data represents global surface level NO2 concentrations at a native resolution of one by one kilometer, but that we've averaged to underlying census block groups in the United States. The demographic information that's contained in this geodatabase comes to us from the US Census Bureau's American Community Survey, or ACS. The ACS is a nationwide survey that collects and produces information on housing, demographic characteristics, socioeconomics, et cetera, regarding our nation's population and provides information related to these topics in the years between the decadal censuses. Now, in this input file, we're specifically using ACS's five-year estimates between the years 2015 and 2019. ACS also has three-year and one-year estimates, just for your awareness, but these one- and three-year estimates are not available at the census block group level and might actually be prone to additional uncertainties and errors based on the response rate and sample size. The other key data set that is integrated within this input geodatabase are the census block group boundaries. And this data set comes from a data set known as TigerLine, which stands for Topologically Integrated Geographic Encoding and Referencing. So it's, it's quite a mouthful. Now, all three of these data sets are available for the entire US. But prior to this training, I formed a smaller data set, again, just for the state of Maryland to slim down on the file size. So it's this Maryland specific file that hopefully has been loaded into your workspace now and, and we'll start playing with. Now beneath this import or read file line, there's a print statement that allows us to explore the contents of this geo database. So if your code was successfully able to run, you'll notice that there is some output that is printed on our screen. And this output summarizes the different columns that are contained in our geo database. Some of the columns names might be self-explanatory. Uh, some are a little bit more confusing. So we've also included some comments in this code to precisely explain what each of the different columns represent. Most of what we'll be doing today is going to focus on the column that's named NO2. No surprise, this column corresponds to NO2 concentrations. And we'll also be looking at a lot of the columns that begin with the prefix pop. And this here stands for population. And the prefix pop is under, or followed rather by the population subgroup uh, for which population data is given. So for example, pop underscore Hispanic describes the number of Hispanic individuals or residents who live in a particular census block group. So let's go back to what I said a few minutes ago and let's pretend you work for a state or county public health agency and you're tasked with understanding what average NO2 concentrations are like in your area. So we can do this calculation very easily using our geo database. So make sure we're all in the part of the code that's titled calculate an area average concentration. And once you've navigated there, we can hit this run or play button and the code should spit out the overall area average, uh, which is eight parts per billion. The way we were able to calculate this average is we first uh, reference the name of our geo, geo database, which is NO2. We then follow that by a dot or period, and then we tell the Python library which column we want to average. In this case, the column we want to average is NO2. And we follow that by the command mean and then open and close parentheses. 
Now, in this case, case matters, no pun intended. So you're going to have to be vigilant as we go through this exercise and as you code on your own to make sure that you have correct lower and upper case, depending on what you named your variables and columns. So in this case, we named our geo database NO2 with lower case, and our NO2 column within that geo database is named NO2 uppercase. So it might be a little confusing, but again, just be consistent in how you refer to different variables that you've defined or I've defined in this workspace. So what we find is that averaged over the state of Maryland, NO2 concentrations are eight parts per billion. For reference, the World Health Organization guidelines that I alluded to earlier in this training uh, say that NO2 concentrations on an annual average should be around or less than five parts per billion. So in the state of Maryland, this average concentration represents NO2 levels that are about 1.5 times higher than the World Health Organization guidelines for NO2. Now let's go back to another example I gave earlier where you might work for a state or county health agency and you wanna understand differential exposure. That is how different population subgroups are exposed to NO2 concentrations differently. To do this, we're going to need to calculate a population weighted average. Now the difference between a population weighted average and the simple average we just did for the state of Maryland is that in our case for a population weighted average, certain census block groups will be weighted less or more heavily depending on how their population contributes to the overall population. So if you think back to our EJ screen exercise when we were looking in Baltimore, you might remember that I mentioned that there's a census block group that has a lot of heavy industry, but that has a permanent population of zero. If we were to incorporate that census block group into this population weighted average, it would not count towards the average because it has a population of zero. So the mathematical way we calculate population weighted averages is given by this equation that you see on the screen. Now I understand that some of you might not be very familiar or maybe even scared of math, so I wanna break down what this formula means. We have a number of census block groups, and those different block groups are given here by the subscript I. For each of those block groups, we have a NO2 concentration, which here is represented by the level, the letter X. So when you see X with the subscript I, that corresponds to NO2 concentrations in block group I. There's another variable that you see, which is W subscript I. W here corresponds to our weight. And again, we're weighting by population. So this W subscript I corresponds to the population, either the overall population or the population of a particular population subgroup in a given uh, census block group. So if we multiply these quantities together, and then if we sum them over all census block groups, which is what this kind of backwards uh, letter E represents, that comprises the numerator of our population weighted average. The denominator, which I'm highlighting now, sums the weights or the population over all the different census block groups that we're considering. So hopefully that makes sense. And even if it's a little bit unclear, maybe focusing on the code that I've provided will help to contextualize how we can actually implement this formula in practice. So let's scroll down now to this part of the code that has a bunch of lines that begin with PW. That stands for population weighted. We can hit the run button. It might take a second, but you'll notice that there are some statements that are printed beneath this snippet of code. And these statements detail the different population weighted averages for the overall population, as well as for different racial and ethnic population subgroups. So to just touch a little bit on how we calculated these, we leveraged the NumPy library that we imported a few minutes ago. Again, this library allows us to do lots of different mathematical operations, and we specifically use NumPy's sum function, specifically the NAN sum function, which allows us to ignore any missing data that might otherwise complicate some of our results. So we use this NAN sum function and the part of the code that I'm highlighting now corresponds to the numerator or the top of this formula here. So this is where we multiply NO2 concentrations in each census block group by the population and then sum them. And then the part of the code that I'm highlighting here corresponds to the denominator 
where we sum up the population over all different census block groups. So now that that deeper dive into what's exactly going on in the code is out of the way, let's take a look at the different population weighted averages, which again are shown in this print statement that I'm highlighting here. So you'll notice that not all these population subgroups experience the same levels of NO2. This probably isn't a surprise if you have read different sources of literature on environmental justice, as well as been attending earlier parts of the training, but it's interesting to really see some of these results become apparent for our case study of the state of Maryland. So what we see is that on average, the white population experiences the lowest level of NO2 at about 7.1 parts per billion. Now the population subgroup that experiences the highest levels of NO2 is the Hispanic population. And NO2 levels for this particular population subgroup are 8.6 parts per billion. So about 1.5 parts per billion higher than the white population. Now let's say we're also interested in calculating NO2 levels for different income groups. We can do that as well using Python. Now in this case, we won't look at income weighted concentrations in the same vein that we did for population weighted concentrations since race and ethnicity are more categorical, whereas income is more of a distribution or continuous. So in the case of income, we can define different income brackets and then look at NO2 concentrations for these different income brackets. In our case, we're going to define a high income bracket. So this is going to represent census block groups in Maryland where the median household income exceeds the 90th percentile. And this is given by the line of code I'm highlighting here. So what we specifically have done is use NumPy's NAN percentile command to define what constitutes the 90th percentile. We can do the same to define a low income group. So that is the collection of census block groups where NO2 concentrations are, or sorry, where income is less than the 10th percentile. So once we've defined those thresholds for high and low income, we can subset or subsample our geo data frame and only select the census block groups that meet the different criteria. So that's what's shown in these lines of code that use the dot loc or locate command. So again, what we're doing is we're subsetting or subselecting our state, our Maryland state and our two database, and we're pulling out only the census block groups that meet our high and low income criteria. And then we can follow this command with a dot no 2 dot mean, kind of like we did before when we calculated the area average. And this will allow us to find the NO2 concentrations in high and low income areas. So if we run this snippet of code, what we see is that high income areas in the state of Maryland experience less NO2 than low income areas. And the disparities or differences between these high and low income areas NO2 concentrations is over three parts per billion, so it's quite large. So this has been a little introduction to how we can leverage Python and this Maryland State database to calculate statistics related to NO2 for different population subgroups based on race, ethnicity, and income. The last part of today's training is going to focus on how we can make really cool maps and visualizations to better understand how NO2 varies across different geographic areas. GeoPandas makes it really easy to make what are called choropleth maps, where the color of each shape, which in our case are census block groups, is associated with a given column's values. So again, in our case, each shape that we see in a map will represent a different census block group, and we can color these block groups by their NO2 concentrations to make these choropleth maps. And the way we do so is, is quite easy, and it's what you can see here in the snippet of code I'm highlighting. So in order to make the map, like you see me hovering over right now with my cursor, we're going to have to start by referring to our geo database, which remember we named NO2 in lowercase, and then we'll follow that by the plot command and then an open parenthesis. Now, within these parentheses, we can specify a bunch of different arguments related to our map. So the most important argument is the column argument. We need to tell Python which column in our database we want to plot. And as I mentioned, we're interested in plotting NO2 concentrations. So that's what this column equals NO2 means. 
Now we also want to be able to understand the differences in concentrations and, and match those differences with specific concentrations in parts per billion. So if we add this legend equals true command, that allows a color bar to display on our map. We can also define the limits of our color bar in order to have the best contrast between our data set. So in the case here, I've defined a minimum value for a color map of zero. Of course, we can't have concentrations that are negative, so this makes sense. And then I've defined a maximum value of 18. This is somewhat arbitrary, but given the range of NO2 concentrations that we experience in the state of Maryland, this maximum of 18 parts per billion is fitting. Finally, we can get a little bit fancier and add these um, keywords to our legend. So they allow us to put a label on our legend or color bar and to create this triangle above 18 to let readers or viewers know that we have saturated the color bar at 18 parts per billion. And finally, we can then close this plot command with a close parenthesis. And then generally maps don't usually have an X and Y axis like a bar chart or scatter plot might. So we can use this set underscore axis underscore off command to turn these axis spines off. So if we do that, we can hit the run button. It might take a second because there's many different geometries to plot, but you should see a map like I'm hovering over here up here. Now I realize not everyone would be familiar with Maryland, but if you are, you might notice that there is an important part of Maryland, an important geographic feature that is missing. And that geographic feature is the Chesapeake Bay, which is one of the largest estuaries in the world. So if you were presenting this map to, let's say, going back to our example, a city or state or county health department, they might want to see these geographic bodies of water on their map so they can maybe orientate themselves better to where exactly they're looking at the map. Geopandas makes it fairly easy for us to add other shapes or other geometries to these maps. So in our case, what I've done prior to this training is supplied all of you in our training materials with a shape file of Maryland's marine boundaries. You can often find shape files that are freely available for various geographic features like the Great Lakes, like oceans, like rivers. So again, I've just done that and I've put this shape file corresponding to Maryland's Chesapeake Bay in our materials folder. Now the way that we're going to add this shape file or this geographic data set to our map is going to require us to rework things a little bit. So I'll walk us through what we're going to do now. Let's scroll down to this next snippet of code that has an opening line that begins with read in the shape file. We can run it and as it's running, I'll, I'll walk us through what's going on. So this line that begins with the phrase shore or the word shore, this is similar to what we did earlier in this part of the training, but instead of reading in our geo database for Maryland's NO2 and demographics, we're now reading in information about the Chesapeake Bay and its boundaries. Again, it might take a little while since the Chesapeake Bay has pretty complex um, geometries. But then once that's loaded in, we are going to define an axis and figure. So we can think of these as kind of a parent a plot on which we can put both our NO2 concentrations as well as the Chesapeake Bay shoreline. So once we've created this parent figure and axis, which is shown in this PLT subplots command, we can repeat the NO2 plot command that I walked us through in the previous snippet of code, but we just have to make one little tweak to it. Since we're now plotting, plotting on this parent axis, we need to tell the plot command where we're going to put our plot. So before the column argument of this plot command, we're going to have a command that says axis or ax equals ax. So that says our axis object, which we've defined in the previous line, it's on the object that we want to plot this choropleth map. The next line of code plots the Chesapeake Bay coastline. For those of you who have maybe worked with geographic data before, you know that there's different ways that we can define coordinate systems and project a map. And currently what's going on is that our NO2 data set has a different coordinate system than the Chesapeake Bay shoreline data set. So before we can plot the Chesapeake Bay shoreline data set, we need to make sure that its coordinate system matches that of our NO2 data set. So this two underscore CRS command just tells GeoPandas to make sure that 
that our Chesapeake Bay shoreline data set has the same projection information as our NO2 data set. But once we've taken care of that, we can use the familiar dot plot command, and we can add in a few keywords to specify what color we want the Chesapeake Bay's borders to be and what color we want the water to be. In our case, I'm just making the water white and the edge of the bay black. And then finally, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, a lot of times maps don't have an X and Y axis like other plots do, so we can, again, turn the axis off, which is this axe.setaxisoff command. So hopefully that explanation makes sense. And uh, hopefully in this amount of time, as I've walked us through what's shown in this snippet of code, you've been able to run this segment of code and see Maryland's NO2 concentrations plot back up, as well as the Chesapeake Bay appear. Now let's say you're interested in zooming into a certain limited geographical portion of the state of Maryland. Let's say this region is the Baltimore-Washington corridor that we've been focusing on throughout this training. We can do that pretty easily using the set xlim and set ylim commands. So this next snippet of code adds those commands in. The first four lines of the snippet are what we just did above. So I won't really spend much time explaining those again. But if we want to zoom into a certain region, we'll just add a couple lines of code. Again, this set xlim and set ylim commands. And we can just pass those different commands, our latitude and longitude bounds in units of degrees. And then doing so will allow us to zoom in to just the Baltimore-Washington corridor. So while that loads, there's just one final last command that I want to introduce us to today. It's one of the built-in commands with matplotlib, and it's the save fig command. So this allows us to take these plots that we've been making in this interactive window and save them to our Google Drive. And this might be useful if you're maybe making a report for your employer or for your work, and you want to have a nice flashy graphic to put in it. So we can use the plt.savefig command and then pass that command the path where we want to save our file. Um, and then we can just name our file. In our case, I've named it no2 underscore Maryland. This might get a little complicated and ahead of ourselves, but we can save these different uh, plots using a variety of different file formats. Here I've chosen to use a PNG, but you can also use things like PDF or EPS. And we can also increase and decrease the resolution using this DPI command. So I hope you've been able to follow along through this interactive Python exercise. I understand that there is, of course, a learning curve associated with Python or really coding in any language. But a cool thing is that lots of code can be repurposed. And you can just retweak certain variable names and arguments uh, for the purpose of tailoring that code to your own work. So with this in mind, if you're interested, I'd encourage you to work with this code that we've provided and adapt it to other uses. So for example, on your own time, instead of plotting NO2 concentrations in Maryland, why don't you plot the percentage of the population who identifies as Hispanic or Latino? If you recall in this NO2 data set that we loaded in at the beginning of our Python exercise, which is named NO2 in lowercase, there were also columns named pop underscore Hispanic and there was another column that detailed the total population. So in theory, if you had interest in time on your own, you could recreate this plot, but again, not show NO2 concentrations, but you might show the percent of people who identify as a certain racial or ethnic group. Or maybe you're still interested in looking at NO2 concentrations, but you wanna zoom into a different part of Maryland. Maybe you are interested in NO2 concentrations in Cumberland, Maryland, or in Frederick, Maryland. On your own time, you could maybe play around with these X and Y limb commands and figure out how you'd zoom into these other regions. That brings us to the end of our third and final part of this training. To summarize what we talked about today, I detailed a couple different tools that can help us interact with environmental justice related data sets and visualize these data sets. Today, we opened up by talking about EJ Screen, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA's Environmental Justice Screening and Mapping Tool. This data set is really cool because it uses nationally consistent data and is super accessible to those who have maybe a limited knowledge of computer programming and allows us to start to explore different data sets and understand patterns of injustice 
without having to find our own data and reformat it ourselves. We then talked about Python, which is an open source coding library. Although understanding and using Python requires a little bit of background knowledge or practice, it allows us to be really customizable in how we analyze data sets and make statistics. And another great thing about Python that I've alluded to several times now is that it's freely available and open source, meaning you'll never have to pay for it. I'll pass things over now to Dr. Sarah Strode for a wrap up for this entire training. Thank you, Gage, for taking us through those interactive exercises. Since this is the final portion of this three-part webinar on satellite data for air quality, environmental justice, and equity applications, we'll now go through a brief overall summary of the training. During this training, we saw how remote sensing data can provide a valuable resource for environmental justice applications. In addition to our focus on air quality, we saw examples of a variety of applications, including green space, lights at night, drought, and heat and energy. Combining satellite remote sensing data with socioeconomic information can provide evidence of disparities, inequality, and environmental injustice. Some of the strengths of remote sensing data include its extensive spatial coverage, which provides us information over large areas of the world and helps us understand how air quality varies over space and time. Another strength is availability in regions where ground-based observations are not available. However, when using satellite data for a particular application, it's important to consider the temporal and spatial resolution of the remote sensing data product and how to relate column quantities to the pollution levels in air we breathe near the surface. We discussed satellite data products relevant to air quality. And at the end of this presentation, we provide links to some of the resources that were discussed for accessing and visualizing the data. And finally, we went through demonstrations of EJ screen and Python tools for analyzing remote sensing data for EJ applications. This training also includes one homework assignment, which opens today, September 6. You can access the homework from the training webpage and submit your homework via Google Forms by September 20th. In order to receive a certificate of completion, participants need to have attended all three live webinars and complete the homework by the September 20 due date. You will then receive the certificate by email approximately two months after completing the course. And now I would like to offer a big thanks to Gage Care for today's hands-on demonstrations and to all of the guest speakers who contributed to this training. Your work has highlighted the scope of different environmental justice issues that can be assessed using satellite remote sensing data, along with the benefits and the challenges of working with remote sensing data in these types of applications. Thank you for sharing your work and expertise with us. On this slide, we've provided contact information for our trainers, as well as links for our set and our sister programs. We've also provided links to some of the resources that were discussed during the webinar, and you can find additional links in the part one and two trainings as well. These slides will be available on the RSET website so you can refer back to them. I would also like to highlight one of the resources we listed on the previous slide, the Air Quality Data Pathfinder. This is another place to find information on data sets that are commonly used for air quality research and applications. And you can see some examples listed here. The Air Quality Data Pathfinder is designed to help guide users through the process of selecting and using data sets applicable to air quality with guidance on spatial, temporal, and spectral resolutions. It includes direct links to the data sources tools to analyze and visualize the data, and tutorials and training. Thank you for participating in this webinar on satellite data for air quality, environmental justice, and equity applications. We will now move to the question and answer portion of the training. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'll be handling the question and answer portion of the training. And to start off with, we had actually a couple questions on the theme of the fact that the uh, EJ Screen tool is available only in the US. So if you're working outside the US, uh, how can you find, or do similar tools exist, and how can you find that information? Um, so Dr. Gage Kerr, uh, I believe, has some resources he'd like to share with us. 
if you're online. Yes, Carl, are you able to hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. Um, as I, um, as Carl mentioned, EJ Screen currently is only available for the U.S. And given that the EPA is a U.S. government entity, it's likely that this tool will be available just for the U.S. for the foreseeable future. There are some resources uh, such as an EJ Atlas that I've linked in our questions and answer document um, that might help depending on exactly what environmental stress or hazard you're interested in. Also, I know what I'm about to say is maybe a lot of work, but if folks on today's training are particularly savvy when it comes to coding, in theory, you could make your own version of EJ screen for a given area. I shared in today's training the equations that are fairly simple um, from which we calculate EJ indices. So if you had environmental information like NO2 or PM data sets, as well as demographic information, um, you could average those data to underlying administrative units. You know, it might be parishes or departments, depending on the country you're in, and then calculate in a similar fashion to EJ screen, uh, EJ index. Okay, thank you. Um, so question two uh, if, is about if the EJ screen model does not include NO2, does the screen add it or does the ArcGIS software include a model for it? We are assessing canceled risk in census blocks. So uh, this question actually came in before we went through the EJ screen demo where we showed you how to add the NO2 data set uh, created by the George Washington University team uh, and others into EJ screen and how to use that. So hopefully by watching that demonstration, you now uh, know how to include that data set in EJ screen. Um, of course, if you uh, want to use this at another time, that data set will still be available for you to use in the future. Um, and we also have uh, data at the, to access the, the native data. If you want to, for example, look outside the United States, uh, there's a link in this Q&A document, uh, which has resources detailing the data set and uh, how to analyze it. And you can discuss with us uh, if you have any questions about how you might uh, do that for other applications, which might not be within the EJ screen uh, area of, of uh, application. Okay, so question three, uh, NASA info regarding air quality concentrating on uh, or concentrations of NO2 or PM2.5 is available only for the USA. I'm interested in Europe. So again, um, the demonstrations we gave today were focused on the US uh, in part because the EJ screen tool, as we discussed, covers the United States only. Um, but the data sets we discussed, especially in earlier parts, in part one and part two of the training, many of those have uh, global coverage. Um, so I, I encourage you to refer back to part two to look for specific data sets that have global coverage and might apply to your area of interest. Uh, question four, where can we get resources to locate this type of satellite data map service? Um, I'm not sure exactly what this is referring to, but I think the question relates to uh, basically finding other types of satellite data which can be ingested into EJ screen in a manner similar um, to what Gage showed us today. Uh, and I think we had the answer to a previous question. Basically, um, unfortunately, this does require some uh, familiarity with GIS to reprocess available uh, satellite data sets into the kind of data sets that could be ingested uh, into EJ screen. So again, I think uh, if you have that interest, um, you can reach out to Dr. Uh, Gage Kerr after the training and he can help guide you in the right direction as to how to uh, do that analysis. Uh, I don't know if you want to add something else to that, Gage. Uh, no, I think uh, you covered it well. Thanks, Carl. Okay. So uh, question five, regarding the NO2 data and the population in Baltimore, I was wondering if the population data is updated or how often it's updated and if it corresponds to census data. So uh, we've linked here the information page, which is associated with the EJ screen. So that details the data sources they're actually using. And for the population information specifically, um, the website says that these, these data are derived from the US Census Bureau's American Community Survey, um, which in the case of EJ screen uses estimates gathered over the five-year period 
from 2017 to 2021. Um, and there's an additional reference there for more information on how those population estimates, uh, what they are and, and how they were, what they were derived. Uh, so question six, do you recommend using EJ screen to look at rural communities or are there more data gaps? Uh, Gage, I think you provided the answer for this. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Sure. Uh, another great question. Um, the data that are used in EJ screen are available um, on a national level, right? There's there's not really gaps in the data, which is one asset or strength of EJ screen. With that being said, though, uh, as I mentioned in the answer for this question, um, there might be some considerations that you'd want to think through before um, launching into an analysis in rural communities. So I've touched on one in the response. Uh, one that came to my mind is that census block groups, which is the unit of analysis that EJ Screen uses, are optimized for population. And we all know that rural areas are less populated, so census block groups might be really large in area. And the reason I bring that up is because let's say you're interested in a certain source of pollution in rural areas. When you average uh, the native data sets used in EJ Screen, uh, over really large areas, it might kind of wash out or um, diminish the importance of that source. So hopefully that explanation and example makes sense. Uh, that's not at all to say that you can't use EJ screen in rural areas, but it might just uh, be important to think through exactly what you're interested in and how um, that particular source or stressor is uh, represented in the screening tool. All right, thank you. Uh, and I think this this next question is for you as well. So regarding the communities with higher percentage of color in Baltimore who are subjected to higher levels of air pollution, are they underrepresented, underrepresented or purposely uninvolved politically with the environmental consequences from local industry? Or are they mainly living in these higher polluted areas due to financial reasons since communities near heavy industry will likely be cheaper to live in? I'll just start off by saying, um, you know, I don't live in, in these communities I highlighted, so I'm speculating here, but I think for whoever asked this question, all of these factors are at play. Um, we know from the unfortunate history of, of race and uh, racism in the U.S. that certain communities have been disenfranchised from uh, political processes and uninvolved when it comes to important decisions about industries and, and pollution sources that are cited next to uh, these communities. Um, the point that was made about property values, I definitely think um, is at play. As someone who likes real estate and finds himself uh, scrolling through Zillow and Redfin and looking at houses, sometimes um, those areas that we were discussing uh, have property values that are quite uh, less expensive than other parts of the city. So for folks that have a lower household income, this might be um, an area of the city where they can afford to live. So I think, again, both these factors are at play. Okay, uh, so question eight, what are good resources to learn how to process level two data from tropomian veers? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So that's uh, a step that might go into creating the kind of data sets we use today. Uh, we discussed tropomian veers a little bit in part two, but we didn't go into detail about processing level two data uh, basically because of time constraints. So if you're interested in doing that, I'd highly recommend uh, starting out with the previous R set trainings we, we've given. Um, there are trainings specifically on tropomy and then a training on uh, both modus and veers, which, which covers veers uh, in some detail. And those both give examples of how to access and analyze um, the level two data outputs from those instruments. So question nine, hi, uh, one question, is there a fork of EJ screen to another country outside the US? Is it possible to get some core open component of EJ screen, for example, from GitHub with given guidelines to import maps and the needed data sets uh, for the given country? So I think this was sort of touched on a little bit in Gage's response to part one that uh, you know you might need to be able to have a little bit of expertise, but it, it should in principle be possible to recreate a version of EJ screen for other countries. Uh, I don't know if you want to add uh, any anything to that, Gage. Um, not much, just that as the, the questions were coming in, I did a quick Google um, on, for example, GitHub, looking if there was anything I could find. I couldn't find anything. That's not to say it doesn't exist, but um, yeah, I'm just not aware of, of what was asked in the question. OK. Uh, so it sounds like a good uh, research project. 
Um, question 10. Uh, I'm looking at NO2 data for Tucson, Arizona, where I live, and I noticed that the Tucson Electric Power uh, Sun Generation Station doesn't appear as an NO2 source, although I know it should. The base load natural gas generators emit NO2, and the ICE peaking generators definitely emit a spike of NO2 when they come online. Could the issue be the temporal nature of satellite data, uh, that the temporal nature of satellite data is missing these periodic emission events? Uh, yeah, so that's that's a really good point. Um, there are, I think, a number of factors that could play into the fact that you're not seeing this particular power plant showing up in this particular NO2 data set. Uh, I listed a couple here, but that's only, I think, scratching the surface. So this data set represents a 2019 annual average, and as you indicated, um, either the temporal aspect of the the for example, the peaking generators coming on at specific times when the satellite's not overhead could certainly have an influence. Um, I don't know how active this power plant was in 2019 specifically, but that could have an influence. Uh, generally, these power plants have uh, stacks, uh, smokestacks, basically. Uh, so the emissions are not happening at the ground level. They're actually happening higher up. And so they wouldn't necessarily impact the ground level pollution. Uh, at least on an average nearby the power plant, but more have a more regional impact on the surrounding area. So we wouldn't necessarily notice sort of very high concentrations in the immediate vicinity of the power plant. It might be spread out over a wider area. Um, and then as Gage mentioned earlier, you know, depending on the definitions of the census blocks, um, the effects of individual point sources might be kind of smeared out or averaged over uh, over the census blocks, just depending on how they're defined. Um, so yeah, there, there are several reasons, I think, why the it might not be represented in this data set. Um, I would maybe encourage, uh, if possible, to take a look at if there are surface-based NO2 monitors in the vicinity of that uh, power plant. Uh, you know, is the data from those surface-based monitors in reasonably good agreement if they were operating back in 2019? with this data set and that could help you sort of locally locally validate this data set because remember this is this is well this is a specifically a nationwide data set that we were working with today but that itself was derived from a global data set so it was it was basically developed with a global basis and validated in that way but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's equally valid in all parts of the world and in all communities so that's definitely something to keep in mind all right so we'll move on from that um, Question 11, is there a repository for the air quality data sets that we can access to use with EJ screen? Um, I think I'll, I'll let Gage uh, answer this one as well. Uh, sure, I provided a link in the questions and answer document uh, from the official EPA EJ screen website. And this link contains uh, different files you can download in a variety of different uh, formats. And if you're interested in doing more than just visualizing the different indicators, but actually kind of getting your hands dirty and, and looking at the data, uh, I'd encourage you to visit this link and play around with the data sets. I'll pass it back to Carl. Thanks. OK, question 12. What emissions provide data with a high resolution of up to one square kilometer or more for air quality analysis, NO2 extraction, for example, in Europe? Um, so that was something we discussed in part two of the training about uh, specific data sets. Uh, there are uh, global satellite aerosol optical depth data products, for example, the MIAC data product from MODIS and uh, the NOAA data product from the VIRS instrument. And an upcoming MIAC data product from VIRS uh, hopefully will be released soon as well, which have one kilometer or higher resolution for aerosol optical depth and have global coverage, which should include Europe. Um, there are currently, an, yeah, you mentioned NO2 specifically, so there are currently no missions with that high of a spatial resolution for NO2, uh, and that's really a function of the, the design trade-offs that we need to make to get the higher spectral resolution, which is necessary to extract information about trace gases like NO2. We sometimes need to sacrifice a little bit in terms of the spatial uh, resolution, so that's that's a current limitation. Um, I will, though, say that there are derived data products, so not, not directly the missions, but the derived data products, which provide, uh, in some cases, higher resolution data sets. And 
one of the ones which we've been discussing today is that that global NO2 uh, annual average data products created by the, the George Washington University group in which were used to create the data sets that we were looking at uh, today. Um, so I have a link uh, in the Q&A document to those data sets. So those are you know, not directly satellite data products, but they incorporate multiple sources of information which allow them to uh, extract some, some uh, higher fidelity features and get higher data, higher resolution data from those data sets. All right, so uh, question 13. When I open the file with Colab, I get the message and a stack trace. The file has been corrupted or is not a valid notebook file. So um, hopefully this is not a general issue with the file itself. Uh, the primary thing to do, I think, if you're getting this kind of an error, is to try downloading the file from the RSET web page again and trying again. And do make sure that uh, the, the way we've saved the file onto the website uh, to allow the, it to be hosted is as a zip file. So .zip is the extension there. So make sure you open up that zip file using your, your whatever preferred software you use to, to work with zip files. And you take out the file inside that, which has the .ipynb extension. That's the actual uh, Python notebook file. Um, so that may have been one of the reasons why you were getting that error message. Question 14, uh, I'm already familiar with libraries like pandas, geopandas, pyplot, numpy, et cetera. Can I bypass the part where I need to use Colab and use my computer instead, or is the code computationally expensive? So yes, you can absolutely run this code on your computer. Um, there are a couple of uh, modifications that you need to do, but if you're a, you're a reasonably experienced Python user, that should be a problem. Uh, you would have to, of course, install all the packages that you need to run the code, and you'd have to modify some of the um, the file paths uh, to correspond to the directory on your computer instead of the Google Drive directory. But yes, in principle, you can you can certainly run this. Oh, and you'd also have to download the uh, input data. So in the example I showed, we created a uh, a shortcut to a Google Drive which has the necessary input data. You could also, of course, download that data to your computer. Uh, we didn't have people do that today just to, to save people a little bit of, of time and, and uh, disk space without having to download the data themselves. Uh, but of course, you could go to that uh, file and download the data, save it locally on your computer, and then update the file paths accordingly. Uh, in terms of computational intensiveness, uh, I would say this code is not, not that computationally intensive if you were maybe analyzing the whole country's worth of data, it might get a little bit uh, a little bit tricky, but if we're restricting ourselves, in this case, to the state of Maryland, uh, it should run reasonably well on a relatively up-to-date personal computer uh, without any special computational requirements. Uh, so question 15, if it is confirmed and scientifically verified that a certain underserved community is found to be a victim of environmental justice or injustice, what is the next step to resolve the issue? Uh, so that's really sort of the key question motivating this entire training. Uh, what do we do about these problems? And that's unfortunately a little bit beyond my expertise. Um, I guess my advice would be sort of organizing in your community, uh, building a sort of support behind doing something about these issues and then directing that support against or at the local authorities that have the, the power to, to take actions to resolve these issues. Uh, and I think the, the, the role played by the NASA data in this that we've been talking about is really to, to build up the evidence to get the community, um, to educate the community about the situation and highlight really the, as you mentioned, the, the scientific basis behind these issues. And that could be a, a useful tool in community organizing and in uh, you know motivating uh, political actors to take action around these issues. Um, I don't know if, if Gage has a little bit more to add on. Sure. That. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Um, I'm going to put something in our questions and answer document. Um, I, I'd also like to reflect that this is a complex question and, and maybe doesn't have a one single answer, but there are some EPA resources um, by which you as a concerned citizen can report environmental violations. Um, you can give information about the suspected violator's name, their location, city, et cetera. Um, another thing that might not be the most satisfying, but is an option is there is 
funding available through the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA that allows uh, community groups to maybe get access to more monitoring devices or other sets of, of data or instruments that can help them better understand the extent of a problem. Um, so if there's maybe a suspected source that's not entirely confirmed or scientifically verified, leveraging some of this governmental funding could be a way to provide more evidence that there is um, a serious environmental justice issue occurring. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think the next question is for you as well. Do we have a suggestion about how to look at specific or how to look specifically at population weighted averages for Native Americans, or is this a limitation of the ACS data? Uh, there's definitely a way to look at uh, Native American and American Indian populations, and that way is through ACS as well. So when it comes to our example in Maryland, um, for the sake of time, and since uh, this population subgroup is uh, constitutes quite a small percent of Maryland's population, we didn't focus on it today. But if you were to download the ACS data, which is a fairly easy process, um, you'd have information about the a uh, number of individuals who identify as Native American or American Indian in either census tracts or census block groups or census blocks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so question 17, uh, you need to pay close attention, I guess this is more of a comment, you need to be, pay close attention to the spelling and the folder naming as exercise is spelled uh, with an extra C. So yeah, I apologize for that. That was my mistake in creating these directories. Um, uh, unfortunately, everything is written in such a way that it assumes the incorrect spelling of exercise. So if you move forward with that incorrect spelling, which is how it's written in the, the instructions, uh, things should work. But unfortunately, if you choose to use the correct spelling, um, that might break things. So uh, I think maybe for future versions of this, this code, we'll, we'll correct that and make everything work accordingly. But um, for now, uh, unfortunately, that was a typo. So just move forward with the, the way it's written in the code and the way it's written in the instruction documents and that should work properly. Uh, so question 18, I have R set SD for EJ P3 Python exercise as a subfolder to that or having the exercise materials as a subfolder to the R set SD for EJ P3 Python exercises folder and both are giving me error messages in the first step. It should be content drive slash my drive slash SD for EJ Python exercise slash SD for EJ Python exercise materials, right? Um, it finds SD for EJ Python exercise, but nothing below that. So, all right. So, so I think that that last file path you have there is the correct uh, path. Um, again, these are all specified in the Python code, and if you're familiar with the Python code language, uh, you can modify those file paths to match whatever directory file structure you want. Um, however, the way it's written, it does assume that file path. And if it's not finding the uh, the subfolder, the exercise materials subfolder, uh, it it maybe that the the shortcut was not being created properly. Um, so my advice would be to sort of just retry, go through the steps of creating that that exercise shortcut and try again. Um, are the NO2 data for the Maryland analyses from ground-based monitoring? So uh, I guess Gage can jump in on this, uh, but my understanding is it's a it's a combined or level level four data product, which includes multiple different input information sources. Yep, that's correct. Um, so this uh, particular product that we mentioned today and that we visualized using Python as well as EJ screen um, relies on, on ground monitors. It relies on information about uh, land use type. So where factories are, where roads are, et cetera, as well as on NASA satellite data. Thank you. Uh, question 20, uh, are there plans on conducting satellite data validation measurements by research institutions or other agencies? So I would say, yes, this is, as a, a sort of a general question, yes, this is something that's very commonly done anytime a new satellite mission is launched. For example, the Tempo mission, which launched uh, earlier this year in April, is currently going through its, its calibration and evaluation and many different other missions and research groups are participating in that using their own instruments and data sets and trying to sort of correlate those with what the satellite's seeing and make sure there's good agreement. So uh, yeah, this is this is something that's very typically done where 
either you know within NASA or and also of course including other agencies that operate similar instruments there's sort of cross calibration to verify that instruments which should be retrieving similar quantities are in fact retrieving similar quantities to make sure that everything is operating as it should be um, so question 21 is it true that the quality of air can be tracked only by the concentration of no2 so that is I know we've been focusing quite a bit on no2 in this training but yeah it's it's not it's certainly not the only uh, factor that affects air quality so the reason we were focusing on no2 is because it's commonly used as a tracer or a proxy for fossil fuel combustion so looking at no2 data in satellite derived data sets uh, can be very powerful because there's relatively good agreement between the satellite uh, detections of NO2 and the ground-based concentrations, a relatively high correlation at least. Um, and it's a good standalone way to get a sense for the industrial and traffic related sources and broadly speaking, the urban types of air pollution sources. Uh, but there are certainly other air pollutants of interest, as well as air toxics, uh, formaldehyde, benzene are, are things that might be of interest to you. And also, of course, there are aerosols, like uh, which contribute to particulate matter pollution. Uh, that's also a major driver of air quality in, in many areas around the world. Uh, and those other pollutants could have very different uh, patterns of spatial and temporal variability than NO2. So I would say while, while NO2 is a good starting point, especially if you're starting to use satellite data to look at air quality, um, it's certainly not a comprehensive metric of air quality. So question 22, is there a way to download data sets from EJ screen from my region and get NO2 data for other states similar to what was provided for Maryland? Um, I think Again, this was sort of addressed in some of the earlier uh, answers. For example, uh, question 11. Um, Gage, I don't know if you want to add anything else onto this as well, onto this here. Uh, no, I think you said just about everything. Um, in addition to question 11, a couple other places in this Q&A document, I've provided a link to where you can access the NO2 data. The one caveat is, um, the publicly available NO2 data currently are available in a gridded format. So this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about imagining a fishnet spread over the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, there are plans to perhaps release this data set down the road in uh, census tract averages. So uh, stay tuned in the future for information on that. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, and then question 23, are there pitfalls or common assumptions about analyzing environmental justice that people should be aware of? For example, how safe is it to assume a nearby emission source is the cause of pollution in a neighborhood and what might lessen uncertainty? Uh, I guess, Gage, do you have any comments about that? Sure, uh, it's a great question. And uh, of course, it's difficult to uh, attribute pollution experienced in a particular you know, neighborhood or a census block group to a particular source without doing more complex work. And by more complex work, I mean model simulations where you might uh, try to turn on and off, so to speak, the different sources and understand how pollution changes. With that being said, though, um, NO2, as we've discussed in previous parts of this training, has a very short lifetime which means that it hangs out or sticks around near where it's emitted. So if you have a case where there is a maybe factory or incinerator or a really busy highway intersection in a neighborhood and not much else, uh, we might be able to reasonably assume that the pollution, the NO2 pollution in that area is due to that particular source. Uh, so maybe this isn't the most satisfying answer, but I think it's kind of a case by case basis that we have to think about the pollutants of question, we have to think about the other sources in the area and having those answers will help us understand how much stock we can place in um, our kind of attribution. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as you mentioned, uh, it's source apportionment or source attribution is I think the term that's used for this kind of an analysis. So if you're if you're interested, you can look up literature about those topics and get a lot of uh, ideas on how that might be done. And then um, just, if I can just say one more thing, too, to go back to the first part of this question, um, there's, of course, a whole body of literature thinking about how we 
um, refer to marginalized communities. So when the person who asked this question asked about pitfalls, uh, I think we should be cognizant of uh, the way we refer to communities, um, making sure we you know, place their humanity um, in front or of you know, any kind of stressor or marginalization that they feature. I know there's also the possibility that some research in the space of EJ might uh, further stigmatize these communities by maybe oppressing, suppressing rather property values. So for those of you who are interested in research on this topic, being cognizant of ways that our research might further stigmatize these communities is something that we should uh, keep in the back of our minds. Actually, the front of our minds, not in the back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, okay, so question 24, what format do satellite data have to be in in order to load into EJ screen or Python? Um, I think gauge for EJ screen, the, uh, the ArcGIS format, you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, let me start with Python since that's a little easier. Mm -hmm. I'll just okay. say that Python is pretty flexible in that um, it can, with the correct libraries, accept a variety of formats, whether that be the geo database like we use today, whether that be a uh, .r file like you might use an R, or whether that might be a CSV or Excel file. When it comes to EJ screen, though, if you're trying to upload a custom layer into the tool, um, you'll need to use the uh, ArcGIS REST API. So that was that kind of long link with a lot of um, letters and numbers that was provided to you uh, for you to upload as a custom layer. So producing those um, ArcGIS REST files is a little bit more involved and that might require you to have knowledge of GIS as well as a GIS license. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think we're coming to the end of our, our allocated time. Um, so we're gonna bring the question and answer session to an end now. Um, if there are any additional questions that come in, again, we'll be compiling them all into this Q&A document and finalizing our answers, and that should be uh, shared out via the RSET uh, webpage soon. Uh, the homework for this um, training is also gonna be available uh, through the RSET uh, webpage for the training. And again, you need to complete that homework uh, in order to get a certificate for completion uh, for the course. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, so thank you everyone for, for sticking with us through uh, the whole training and all three parts of the training. Uh, and uh, thank you, of course, to, to Gage and all of our other contributors who helped uh, bring their, their knowledge on these topics to us uh, over the course of this training. So have a good uh, rest of your day, everyone.